Good morning, good afternoon, it's afternoon. I wanted to recognize the organizers of this conference uh, on a theme that's so critical to our country at this time in terms of the development of intercultural and global competencies. And so I wanted to recognize them for that, this particular effort. We're very pleased to be here. My colleague Holly Durer and I are going to present on a program. It's a summer study immersion program and some research that uh, Holly has carried out. I would say that somebody much wiser than I once said, a text without context is pretext. And so I think it's important that I talk a little bit about the program and see for, uh, to kind of give you a, a bigger picture. This uh, Verano in Mexico, this is the 31st year that I've been running this program in Mexico. And the purpose of the program is based upon my, I, my undergraduate degrees from the University of the Americas in Puebla, Mexico where I studied, and the purpose of the program was to provide opportunities to students to be immersed in a situation and have opportunities to work in contexts which are applicable to them now in the U.S., particularly with regards to our Mexican student population in the schools. So Holly's study is very much along that line. I'm very thankful that she has done this uh, in terms of that. Um, my goal as a professor in, at the U of A was to, is basically to promote bilingual multicultural issues and intercultural competence. And so um, this, uh, today when we talk, listen to Holly present on her research, uh, she'll be talking about the opportunities that were provided. Why do we forward this here? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the context of the, of the program, you'll see it's a seven week program six weeks in Guanajuato, one week in Mexico City. We are in Mexico in spite of the travel advisory by the Department of State. I know universities in Texas can, cannot go to Mexico or they're somewhat prohibited, but the state of Guanajuato has no issues and Mexico City does not either. The U of A permits us to do this and so I'm very thankful for that. This particular past summer we had 15 students and you can see the different disciplines that they represented and we have a very interdisciplinary faculty who come and participate in the summer. All students stay with a Mexican host family. Uh, we have excursions. We spend a week in Mexico City visiting Casa Azul, Xochimilco, uh, the pyramids, go to the Ballet Folklorico. We visit with faculty at the University of, of Mexico uh, and a number of things. In terms of the students in Guanajuato, they take a class on cultural and linguistic diversity and they're engaged in a service learning project depending upon their background. If they're a school psychologist, they can work with a psychologist. If they're a speech and language uh, person, they can work with a speech and language. If they're a bilingual teacher, they can work with teachers. If they're special education teachers, et cetera. If you're interested in physiology or health, we have medical doctors, clinics, et cetera, where students have the opportunity to do those kinds of things. So that's, that's really important. I think the, 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 the impact of this program is, is an experiential learning program where you engage the community and become involved. And I think we'll see that in the presentation today. Um, I, think, uh, so I think that's, we'll take it from there. So Holly, you need to be mic'd up. Let's see if we can get me unmiked. Not really, I can just leave it here if that works. We can, we can just take it off. Oh, sure. Okay. Here we go. Just plug it. By the way, Holly is an honors student from the Honor College of the UVA, and she got a Gilman scholarship to do this. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I'm an undergraduate student at the University of Arizona, and I'll be graduating this May with degrees in linguistics, special education, deaf studies, and speech language hearing sciences. So uh, this study for me was really kind of a way to uh, integrate all of that while I was abroad as a part of this program. So. Uh, one of my areas of research is in speech and language pathology, and so if you don't know what that is, it's really working uh, with people who have communication disorders, so all the way from children maybe who stutter to adults with strokes or traumatic brain injuries. And so uh, because we know speech language pathology, we're working with people um, who speak different languages, who come from different cultures, and so cultural competence is really key in this profession. So my study looked at five graduate students in this field um, while they were part of the program, 
And it really measures cultural competence growth over the course of uh, the study abroad program, specifically looking at um, the effectiveness of strategies in the program. So like was mentioned uh, in the last presentation here, really looking at what key things are we doing while we're abroad to promote this cultural competence. Um, and so we used quantitative pre and post assessments, and then also more qualitative interviews and a lot of self-reflection um, to kind of gauge that growth over time. And it also included a two-month follow-up after the students returned to the states. So this is the research question. What methods can be applied in cross-cultural immersion settings to develop cultural competence that are specific to these students? And then what are the long-term outcomes as these students deliver services in their professional and clinic work? So here's some background information on why we think this is important. Um, the field of speech language pathology is pretty homogenous. So if we look at it, 92% um, uh, of SLPs in the US are white, whereas only 8% eight, uh, 8 identify as part of a racial minority. Whereas if we look at the US, it's 27% and growing. So there's really a lot of uh, diversity in the US that isn't necessarily accounted for in this field. And then if we look at bilingualism, only 6% of speech language pathologists who specialize in language are actually bilingual uh, service providers, whereas 20% of school-aged children speak another language other than English at the home. So really some key factors here that, you know, if a field is all white, how are we accounting for being able to deliver services to a really diverse um, group of clients? So cultural competence, I feel like I probably don't need to give a full definition to a group of scholars here who study this, really. Um, but what's unique about our approach to it is thinking about cultural competence from the view of healthcare and you know providing services in a medical setting and how key this really is to how we can effectively communicate with people, um, e even though our cultures may be different. So. These were the facilitation strategies that we kind of incorporated into the program based off literature by Horton Izzard et al. Um, and there are five strategies that uh, we used throughout, throughout the course of the program, but then we focused on one uh, initiative each week as we went through. So the first one was using case studies, literature, and in-class activities to transfer knowledge to clinical skill. The second was um, developing culturally sensitive attitudes, and that's looking at sociocultural factors on communication development. So thinking about how we're interacting with people in the city that we were in, um, and our host families and international faculty, and how that's really developing cultural competence. The third facilitation strategy was actually delivering services to individuals from a culturally and linguistically diverse background. So the, these uh, speech language pathology graduate students were in schools in Mexico delivering speech and language services to children. So really that experiential learning component um, came into play here. The fourth initiative was gaining an understanding of the historical and cultural backgrounds of US minority groups. So through excursions um, uh, and other things like that. And then the last was stressing the significance of assessing cross-cultural competence. So each week, these students would write in journals. They would sit down, and I would interview them. And so it would give them many different opportunities throughout um, the, their journey abroad to really assess themselves and reflect on that. So this was kind of the weekly reflection structure in the interviews that I did with them. We would take one of those initiatives and then I have like a, maybe a 15, 20 minute interview about how they're experiencing those initiatives. And so, for instance, from insert experience or activity that aligns with the literature, what was something that stood out to you? So it was typically pretty general questions, really just to get them telling stories and talking about their experiences. So one student's answer was, I think something that stood out to me, something that was reinforced, was just knowing the history and the culture of the people you work with. It allows your work with them to be more personalized and more individualized. You can't just use a cookie cutter method with everybody, especially when working with people from populations from diverse cultures. So that was one example of a response. We would also ask, how do you think you can apply that in your clinical work as a speech language pathologist? So really transferring what they're learning into their future career. And one student's response was, 
I'm just thinking about low-tech options because in the US, our first inclination might be to go for a touch screen or some other device that's more high-tech. I think knowing about the low-tech versions of stuff is really helpful because for some kids, that might work better, and having that experience is definitely useful. So taking another experience that was uh, delivering services and applying it back to their own work. And then the last question we typically ask was, describe a meaningful experience that may have changed your perspective on how you deliver services as a speech language pathologist for linguistically or culturally diverse clients. And this, this is one of my favorite parts of the interview because it was really just totally open-ended and I would collect all these different stories about their experiences that had such a wide range. And here's one that I, I thought really touched upon some key components. Um, and the participant said, there's this one teacher who basically every time we go to pick up this kid, she talks about what a profound difference she's seen in this student. She was like, it's not just up here, but it's in here. And that makes me feel like we're really doing something because sometimes it's hard for us to see a difference. Um, so these are just some examples. We're still going through and we're analyzing all of the responses we have to get general trends, but I feel like this is kind of a nice picture of what we see in uh, the data that we're collecting here. So what we also did in addition to these interviews is we collected more quantitative based data through a cultural intelligence scale. And so there was a series of 20 questions um, that we asked before and after the study abroad experience. And I'm not going to read through all of them, but we have highlighted just a few of the ones that really uh, demonstrated some maximum growth there. So some were I'm conscious of the cultural knowledge I use when interacting with people with different cultural backgrounds. I adjust my cultural knowledge, and I'm conscious of how to apply it to cross-cultural situations. Um, these ones, the change wasn't quite, quite as big, but we still see a, a little bit of growth in things from arts and crafts to uh, rules for vocabulary, things like that. Um, another big one is, I'm sure I can deal with the stresses of adjusting to a culture that is new to me. So in study abroad, we know we have to be really adaptable um, and be able to adjust to different things. And so this is one thing that really popped out across all of the participants' responses. Some uh, final observations we noticed is the way that they're actually using um, some what we call paralinguistic um, cues in, in conversation, and that's things like pause and silence and facial expressions. Um, and so the, the, the tremendous growth in those areas as well, just with this immersion process. Um, so those are some of, some of the findings there, but in terms of uh, general things that we noticed across these students' experiences, here were some of the uh, tidbits we got from their interviews as well. Uh, or sorry, this was uh, a reflection at the very end, two months afterwards, we asked them for specific feedback on all of the initiatives that we were uh, targeting. And uh, it, the results were like pretty phenomenal throughout them. Uh, for instance, this first one using case studies, literature, and in-class activities, 100% agreed that these activities for this initiative were helpful in developing their cultural competence in a professional role as an SLP. Some notes that we saw, um, Practical case studies, like really things that they can apply directly to their work, they found helpful. And we even had visiting uh, scholars from San Diego State University who gave talks on case studies, so we got some collaboration in that regard. Um, but one of the notes we also had from students is like, these are helpful to a point, but after some exposure to these things, um, it became redundant, so application really is the most helpful thing. So we can sit in a classroom all day and learn about uh, literature and case studies, but really going out and applying it is the most effective. Um, the second uh, strategy that we employed, the feedback that we got was also 100% uh, impacting sociocultural factors on communication development. Uh, some of the notes were that these are really valuable on a personal and professional level, and staying with a host family um, was also really important in developing cultural competence. The third facilitation strategy was about actually delivering services to individuals. Um, and this one, we, we saw positive feedback as well that this was particularly important and that this was the main thing that helped develop their cultural competence was actually you know, being in the schools and working with the students. Um, <coughs> 
this one, so this is the only one that got less than 100% uh, agreement on, and this was about gaining an understanding of the historical and cultural backgrounds of US minority groups. Um, and this kind of goes along the lines of, you know, we can learn and learn about things sitting down and reading them, but going out and experiencing them is the most beneficial. Um, and a lot of our students, uh, I think, at least four out of the five had already had immersion experiences in Spain and Cuba and other areas. And so uh, they mentioned, you know, maybe they've already kind of had this growth from past experiences in their life. So this didn't have the biggest effect on their growth in this particular immersion experience. And then lastly, assessing cross-cultural competence. So while, while you're uh, abroad and you know using those journals and interviews, uh, this one, 100% of the participants agreed that the activity was helpful. Uh, keeping a journal and really stopping and reflecting on your actual experience. Uh, because uh, as we all know, when we're abroad, time totally flies by and then you blink and it's done. So being able to reflect on it throughout the entire process was helpful for them. And so uh, these were, uh, in the two-month follow-up afterwards, we kind of asked some broad questions on how they think it was helpful um, and if they believed that they uh, were more prepared as a result of the experience. So one participant said, yeah, absolutely. That, I think, was the biggest takeaway. I think just to have seen another system, another country system, worked with a population that isn't monolingual or bilingual English, to have no English, uh, is really valuable because we're language therapists, not English therapists. Yeah, being able to draw on that experience was invaluable and not something that everyone really gets an opportunity to do, so I'm definitely grateful for it. Moving forward, I think it's going to influence the way I do therapy, so it's nice to know that it's there. Um, and then other responses to that were, yeah, I think so, just the confidence that I can do this. I've done it before. I've worked with culturally and linguistically diverse populations. This isn't new to me. If nothing else, at least that, and I think that says a lot, goes pretty far. And another notable uh, response to that was, definitely because I feel that it's something that's kind of hard to learn when you're in your comfort zone. You definitely have to push yourself outside of your comfort zone. Being, a or being in a different country and working with completely different clients and teachers and schools, everything is unfamiliar and everything is uncomfortable. And I feel that's what really helps you grow professionally. Learning how to communicate with other professionals in other cultures, I feel that that pushes you even more than just learning how to communicate with professionals that you are comfortable with or you feel at home with. So I think that was uh, the, the last bit of uh, findings that we had that were concrete. And so the overall conclusions that we got from this, um, and I welcome your feedback as well because we're still developing uh, all of these conclusions, is that you know, strategies that emphasize actually working with people and fostering relationships, actually delivering those services, and then reflecting on those experiences were favored among the participants. Um, and that was just as a self-reflection, so uh, not, not quite as objective, objective in another sense, but really that's what they enjoyed the most and that's what they believed help their cultural competence grow. And then, while we know that background knowledge and formal learning can help establish a solid, a solid baseline, most, most of the growth really occurs from those experiential learning initiatives. So I think that's all we have. Uh, here's some of the resources we used for that. But I guess we can go ahead and open it up for questions. So. <laughs>